I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us give God a hand of praise this morning, the first Sunday in October. And I ask that you please stand for our call to worship. After that will be a hymn uh, that you remain standing for, and then we'll have our, call, our morning meditation from Ms. Rudell Berry. Our call to worship is at 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 29. Let us begin. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night as he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Amen. Amen. to his name.
Let's give God a hand as Ms. Rudell Berry comes. to come to another October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I encourage everyone to go have their mammograms every year. Do not listen to the report that says women above the age of 74 no longer need their mammograms because at the age of 79 and a half, I was detected with stage two breast cancer. And I'm blessed that my breast cancer is now 10 years in remission. <laughs> so early detection is the key to survival. Go out and get your mammogram. Close your eyes. Touch. Us, Lord Jesus, cover us with your grace, enfold us with your love, strengthen us with your power, teach us to surrender to thy will. You are the potter, we are your Holy Spirit, we feel you. You are always within us. Guide our paths. Order each step. Our Father, you send our trials. Trials teach us courage. Teach us to judge less and love more. As we walk through each valley, we cleave to you. We learn to trust and obey. We learn faith. We testify God always provides for his children. Be still and know God will take care of you. Thank you, Abba Father, Daddy. Your caress quiets our broken hearts. We release our pain to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing our minds and emotions. You lift us up and give us courage to face life again, one day at a time, one step at a time. Weeping may last for a day, but cradled in the Savior's arms, joy in the morning. Touch me, Lord Jesus. Make me whole again. Amen.
with my Savior. It means more to me than anything, anything that this world could ever offer me. I satisfied with the way that he cares for me and how he makes a way even though I'm not all that I should be and yes I'm satisfied with the joy he placed within my soul and how he helped me to bear my heavy load. I am, I am, I am, I am with my Savior. He means more to me than anything, anything that this world
the signature sound of New Covenant Music Ministry. Say amen, somebody. Amen. 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 We just, just love to see and hear. Amen. Some uh, sign of normality coming back to our experience. And, and so it's such a blessing, such a blessing. So thank you for your efforts, amen, uh, music ministry. Uh, before I begin, I want to uh, I just say again thank you to uh, those of you who have prayed for me and have uh, sent cards and you have called and, and uh, uh, you've done so many acts of kindness uh, in uh, this a uh, very difficult season in my life, and uh, it's meant so much to me, to my family, and uh, it has uh, uh, let me know that I'm not alone uh, on, on the journey, and, and it's been very, very, very strengthening uh, to me, and uh, when uh, all your brothers are gone and you only one left, sometimes you have a sense of loneliness, and and you have, um, you have uh, kept me from dwelling there. And I appreciate you all so much more than you will ever, ever know. We, our heart goes out to, to uh, Mother Carrie Snyder uh, just recent in the passing of her son. Amen. And so uh, our family as yes, a church continues to surround uh, grieving families. And uh, it's just a season we're going through, and, and God is with us, and uh, we have victory. We're glad to see uh, Sister Miles back, and I know she's gone off, off to uh, D.C. to take care of Deacon Miles and, and uh, see that he is, uh, as the Bible uh, would, would say, that he joined his ancestors. Amen. Amen. So we are thankful. There are so many families. We, we love you all. Amen. We, we pray for you all. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we know that your spirit does the work. Your spirit produces the fruit. And so we continue to pray that your spirit will teach us and transform us into the image of Christ as we open your word together in Jesus' name. Amen. The shame of a nation. The shame of, of a nation. Ezekiel chapter 16, two verses beginning at 62. God is speaking to his chosen nation. Hear what God says. And I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall know, understand, and realize that I am the Lord. That you may earnestly remember and be ashamed and confounded. And never open your mouth again because of your shame. When I have forgiven you all that you have done, says the Lord God. What shames a nation? What is shame? Shame is defined as a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. We know what shames a person. 
tell me, have you ever been shamed? Have you ever been ashamed? Have you ever known to do better, but you didn't? You knew what was right, but you didn't do what was right. You just chose to do something in spite of knowing how wrong it is. And, and, and you were left, when, when it was discovered, you, you were shamed. Yes, and so many times, people who know us and know that we know better and should do better, and when they find out we didn't, they say it's a low down, dirty, rotten shame. We know what shames a person. But did you know that a nation could also be shamed? Our text today, Ezekiel chapter 16, is a very, very particular chapter of text. It's compelling. It reveals the heart of God. It reveals a heavenly father who has chosen a people, a nation, and has been hurt. Yes, God the father feels pain hurt over his nation, his chosen people. Well, what shames a nation? We can look and see what shamed Israel. What shamed Judah? In chapter 16, I hope you'll spend at least a week there. You need to spend a week in chapter 16 because God speaks in a parable and this is probably one of the most profound Old Testament presentations of the gospel. In a parable, what's happening, the context, is that the nation of Judah is facing invasion from Babylon. And they, they're in disbelief. They're saying, this can't happen to us. Not us. We're the nation of Israel. We are, we are God's chosen. They were so proud of their nation, their temple. Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of the king. Yes, Mount Zion. And they had that pride, that national pride. They were convinced that in spite of all their behavior, God would never allow anything bad to happen to them. After all, they are Jerusalem. The city of the great king. So God speaks to them in a parable. And God says to them, to Judah, to the nation, he says, you are a Canaanite, but your father is an Amorite and your mother is a Hittite. That was a figure of speech used in that time and culture. Uh, it was a way of saying you were unwanted. You were an unwanted child. Read the parable. I hope you spend some time in chapter 16 because God says, when you were born, no one cut your cord. No one washed you and rubbed salt on your body. No, uh, no. when you were born, you were taken to a field and left in the afterbirth. This is what God says to the nation. God says, you were wallowing in your afterbirth when I came alone. I saw you, and I loved you, and I chose you, and I picked you up. I dressed you up. 
I put clothes, the best clothes on your bike. I put food, the best food in your mouth. I put earrings in your ear, rings on your fingers. I love you and raise you up. I married you. I made you my chosen nation. God described his tremendous love. Even though that nation rebelled against God, God loved them. So what shames a nation? What shamed Israel? God's tremendous love was met by Israel's terrible sin. In the parable, God describes the terrible sin of that nation. Even though they, they, they knew, they understood that God had raised them up. God had in a covenant with them. God was their God. They, they sought idol gods. God said, you prostituted yourself with every foreign nation and foreign idol God you could. God even described their spiritual prostitution. God said, listen, uh, prostitutes charge money, but, but you gave yourself away for free. Read the parable. It's the heart of God to a chosen nation who has rebelled against him, forgotten him, taken him for granted. God described in the parable how, how the nation in their spiritual prostitution serving all of these idols they engaged in, in despicable acts of homosexuality and bestiality in serving these idol gods. Yes, God said, you even sacrifice your own children to these idols. You burn your own children in fire offering them to these idols. God's tremendous love but Israel's terrible sin brought on a traumatic discipline. So God, listen, he disciplines a nation. He disciplines people. He disciplines out you and I, and yes, he disciplines a nation. And if you continue to read in Ezekiel's book, you will see God calling out nation after nation and pronouncing his, his judgment upon nations. This should interest us because America is a nation. God's tremendous love, Israel, Judah's terrible sin is met by God's traumatic discipline, so he brings Babylon from the north, Nebuchadnezzar, and his massive army, lay siege to Jerusalem. They will tear down the walls, burn down the temple, and in the midst of the siege, mothers will boil and eat their own children because of hunger. One mother agreed with another mother and said, we'll boil and cook and eat your child today and tomorrow we'll eat uh, your, your child. And so the one mother, after they had eaten the child, she hid her child and so they go to the king. And the king is appalled. How could this happen? How could this happen to the nation? Such despicable things. Such an appalling discipline. Judgment falls on this nation. And they still can't see it. They can't understand it. They're saying, this will never happen to us. After all, we're the greatest nation upon the face of the earth. But thank God, listen, even though God's tremendous love is met, by Israel's terrible sin and God brings a traumatic discipline, there is total redemption. At the end of the chapter, 
God speaks and says, I will establish my covenant with you, even though you walked away from me, even though you have uh, uh, disavowed me, even though you've turned your backs on me, I will establish my covenant with you. You will know and understand and realize one day that I am the Lord. He says, you will earnestly remember and be ashamed. Confounded, I never open your mouth again because of your shame when I have forgiven you for all that you've done. That day is in the future. That day is in the tribulation when, when, when watch this, when all Israel shall be saved. That day is in the future when God will return, when Jesus will return and Israel will finally accept their Messiah as a nation. They rejected him in Matthew 12, but as a nation in Revelation, they will receive and accept him as Messiah, Mashiach. Yes, God sees it. God knows it. And God says, in that day you will be shamed. Yes, when I have forgiven you all that you have done, there will be total redemption for the nation. God has a plan for Israel. God has a plan for his nation into the millennium. What about America? After all, scholars have described America as a special act of God's grace. A nation unlike any other nation. Yes, a nation of immigrants. But when you think about it, when Columbus and Ponce de Leon and the pilgrims, when, when they came sailing up on the shores, the Indians should have danced along with signs saying, close the borders, close the borders, close the borders. <laughs> what about America? We sing God bless America. But America is a nation that has no shame. Yes. When Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, then Israel was ashamed. And you know what? On January 6th, when the capital was assaulted, America refused to show any shame. America tried to cover it over and say it was just a peaceful demonstration and, and, and that, it, that there was nothing wrong going on. Those folk didn't mean to hurt anybody that died. Where's America's shame? Israel as a nation was shame, God said, you won't even be able to open your mouth because of your shame. You will realize how shameful you've been as a nation. What about America? What is America's shame? Could it be a hypocritical creed? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are endued by the creator with certain inalienable rights. Among them, uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, all men created equal. Uh, well, that's a hypocritical statement. Uh, well, 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 what about one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all? Although at one point, black men made up 15% of the general population and 85% of the prison population. Justice for all? Wesley Snipes said when he walked up to the Marion County Courthouse and saw a statue of the Confederate soldiers standing out front, he knew there would be no justice inside that building. 
what could be America's shame? A hypocritical creed, but not only a hypocritical creed, but an inhumane history. Uh, an inhumane history that, 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 that somehow people tried to, to spruce it up. And, and, and to spruce it up, you have to cover it up. To have a church, uh, to, to make it palatable, then, 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 then you have to tell lies like, 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 like the, uh, the black folk love the plantation life. Black people brought from Africa on slave ships, packed in like sardines. Those who didn't die and were cast in the ocean were sold on auction blocks and on the backs of black slaves. The American economy thrived. It's a dirty, rotten shame. Shame on you, America. Shame, shame, shame. Hypocritical creed. An inhumane history, but then a justice system with double standards. Yes. You can't depend on justice in this system because blind lady justice is peeping out of one eye. And when folk who look like me go by the blind lady, she sends me straight to jail. You do not pass go. You do not collect $200. You go directly to jail. Yes, hypocritical creed, inhumane, history, justice system with double standards. But then also the shame of America, a political system that favors the rich and powerful. That's why voting districts are gerrymandered and, and redesigned and structured so as to minimize the vote of oppressed people while maximizing the representation of the rich and powerful. It's a shame. Oh, come on, tell the truth. It's a, it's a dirty, rotten shame. Then finally, there's a culture of sin. A culture of sin. What's a culture? It's a way of life, lifestyle, customs, traditions, a heritage of, of sin. God said to Judah as a nation, this is how he described her. He said, your daughters are Sodom and Samaria. And then God said, to, I hope you read chapter 16. In the parable, God said, your sin is worse than Sodom. You know how bad Sodom's sin was? And you know what? The angels came into the city, and Lot was at the gate. And so the angels, that they, they looked like two men. Lot met them and said, come to my house. You don't want to be out here at night. And the men of Sodom surrounded Lot's house and said, Send the men out to us that we may know them. Now you're going to have to go home and get the biblical understanding of no. Lot said, don't do this. I, I'll send my daughters out. Do to them as you will. They said, no, we don't want no women. Send So, well, wait a minute, Pastor. You can't preach about homosexuality as though it's wrong. That's not politically correct. That's not what people want to hear. You're liable to get some letters and some, some bad publicity. Folks, stop watching. Well, here, you know, the problem, part of the problem is that when preachers stop preaching and start politicizing the gospel. People don't hear the truth. And so, watch this. So, sons and daughters grow up 
from babies all the way to graduation go off, never heard that homosexuality is against the plan and purpose of God in creation. And so they go off, they get involved, they, uh, your son come home with a, with, with, with a, with a, with a, 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 a partner, And, he, and here you all upset and all. Don't be upset. It's because we have failed to teach and to preach and to model Christ likeness. Now, be careful to say that I'm not talking about hating people. Uh, no. No, I'm not talking about. Uh, uh, calling names and uh, no no I'm talking about treating people as Christ would treat them to, to love people and hate sin and we have to do a better job of loving people and hating sin so America you should be ashamed of yourself that's what this pastor says. Your creed is hypocritical. Your history is inhumane. Your justice system has double standards. Your political system favors the rich and powerful. And there's a culture of sin. Yes, but there's hope for America. Thank God that there's hope for America. Listen, even though America is classified now as a post-Christian nation, uh, America is classified as a nation that has turned the corner on Christianity. There's hope for America. There's hope for America. Why? Because there was hope for Judah. What was the hope for Judah? At the very end, did you read it? At the very end, God said, I will establish my covenant with you. Now, his covenant, watch this, started out with Abraham. And when God established that covenant with Abraham, you know what? Gentiles were included. God said to Abraham, through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And we are a nation of the earth. And watch this. If we could just find our way back to God. If we could acknowledge our shame. If we could even come to be ashamed that we have drifted as a nation so far away from God. That there's hope for us. But God says, I know the plans that I have for you. Yes. For good and not evil. To give you a bright hope and a future. He speaks that to America as well. So America needs a soul that can be redeemed. What is the soul of a nation? What is the soul of America? The soul of America is the believers. Those of us who believe in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who have received him as Lord and Savior and have been filled with his precious Holy Spirit, we are the soul of America. And the hope for our nation sits on the pews of churches all over the nation. Whether you're white, black, yellow, brown, whatever, you may call or classify yourself. What's important is that you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You are filled with his precious Holy Spirit and that you are willing to get rid of America's shame. That you are willing to confess as Israel will do. Yes, we messed up. We just walked away from the God who has blessed us over and over and over again, but we are coming back. We're coming home. We're coming back to our God, back to our Savior. Because he will abundantly pardon us. Come on, America. Come on, all of you who are out there. 
I'm not talking to the riffraff that's making all the noise and staying in all the news. You would think that's the majority. I don't believe that's the majority. I, be I believe that the majority is a silent majority. I believe the majority is a shamed majority. Let's get rid of the shame. Let's receive Christ. Let's receive his word. His, let's receive his plea that if we would come back to him, he'll come back to us. And as a nation, as a nation, let's be sure that we are righteous. For righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Maybe you're here today and having heard the gospel, you, maybe you want to respond, maybe you have not received Christ as Savior. You can. We have counselors who will help you with that decision today. Or maybe you hear you know Christ as Savior, but you're not connected to a local church, place where the gifts and abilities, abilities he pours into us at salvation can overflow in ministry to others. If that's you as we stand, we invite you to come. If that's you today, will you come? here today and this is your first time with us and you don't mind just giving us a wave so we'll know you're a first timer. We want to do our best to make you feel welcome. We have a couple of first timers here. All right. We don't do everything we normally do because of the pandemic and social distancing, but we just want you to know how much we love you and we are so thankful that you chose New Covenant this morning. Amen. All right, all right, all right. Well, uh, how about uh, October birthdays? Do we have any October babies? Oh, yeah. Any of the, stand up to you October. Don't be bashful. Stay you October babies. Look at here. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, everybody. Happy birthday to you. We love you, we do. We love you, we do. We love you, everybody. We love you, we do. May the good Lord bless you. 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 And many, 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 many happy returns. Amen. Uh, hopefully you have already made use of the offertory boxes located around the sanctuary. If not, uh, you may do so immediately after the service. At this time, we have uh, one of our famous young men, Brother, Brother Cooper, is going to come and offer a, an offertory prayer. May everyone bow their heads. Dear Lord, thank you for everyone who gave today. Thank you for everything you give to us. Thank you for always being there for us. So thank you for letting us come to church today and listen to your word. Give, thank you for those who didn't give, too, because maybe they didn't have it to give. But thank you for giving us our every need. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
you may have noticed we have a, a different system for uh, distributing our uh, uh, communion uh, packs. Uh, they're in little Ziploc bags for an added, added layer of protection. And so we hope that you have uh, already picked up one. Uh, and uh, therefore, you have a little bag to, to dispose of the cup uh, also. And I uh, just ask that you just pick up a bag because each bag has the same thing in it. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't, don't dig through the looking for, you know, the favorite one or something. They're all the same. And so we don't want you digging through looking. Just, just pick up one. And just, and just, you know, uh, for some reason, we've had people digging through for some reason. So we don't want you to do that because we're trying to keep everybody as safe as we possibly can. So we even went through the uh, uh, added effort of zip locking the cup. All right. And uh, so uh, if you don't have a packet, if you raise your hand, Deacon Davis is walking around now. If you uh, need uh the packet. Amen. Deacon Davis is, is available. Choir, everybody. Everybody's good. All right. When we come to our time of communion, we remember, uh, as we look back at the cross, the uh, pain of the passion of Christ, his suffering on the cross, uh, his death, burial, and resurrection. But we also uh, look forward to the day of his return when he's coming back for his church. Uh, Jesus said, as often as we do this, uh, we show forth his suffering until he returns. Shall we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your grace and mercy, for your goodness, O oh God, and for allowing us another opportunity to uh, sit at your table and partake of this, uh, these elements, this bread that represents the body of Christ and this drink that represents his shed blood. You said in your word, as often as we do this, we show forth your suffering until you come. We pray that you forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, for it is you and you alone who make us worthy to sit at your table. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, may I also say uh, that you may know someone. Uh, uh, maybe they're an elderly person or uh, someone with uh, health issues uh, to the point that, you know, may, the doctors have said avoid crowds. So they're not able to return to the sanctuary. And uh, so I'm asking you prayerfully. Uh, because I'm going to deputize you uh, to serve communion to that person, whoever they might be. Uh, and say, well, what, what do I do, Pastor? Take a pack, a Ziploc pack with you, and do just as you've seen that I'm doing. You don't have to do exactly what I do, but you want to say a prayer. And in that prayer, you want to ask God forgiveness of sin. Because all of us continue to sin and fall short of his glory. There ain't nobody perfect in the building. All right? And, 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 and then you don't even have to go through the pronouncements that I do. Uh, just serve them their bread and their drink in the name of Jesus. Now, this is for uh, maybe an elderly person who can't be here or uh, someone for, uh, for medical or uh, whatever reason can't be here and the Lord places on your heart. Now, if the Lord don't place anybody on your heart, leave it alone, amen? Because you don't want to treat something that's uncommon in a common way. But there may be, the Lord put on my heart, that there may be some, someone who hasn't received communion going on two years, but you can be the server. You can serve them. And if God has put somebody on your heart, they're on, they're on your mind right now. You already know who it is. I just ask that you take a packet with you, and sometime this week you go and see them and represent covenant with them. Amen? Amen. 
on that night when Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. In like manner, he took the cup after he had given thanks. He said, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament shed for many for the remission of sins. If you take a packet, a simple way to administer the cup is to give them the bread and simply say, this bread represents the body of Christ and let them eat and give them the cup and say, this cup is symbolic of his blood and let them drink and end with a prayer. Amen? Amen. God bless you and uh, may he forever keep you without a benediction. There are some containers at the back of the building to dispose of your cups. Have a wonderful, a beautiful week, and God bless you. We will see you when we see you, if we don't see you sooner. That didn't make sense, did it? No.